Frank Marshall, <laughs> Nigel Sinclair, thank you so much for doing this interview and especially for making such a terrific documentary. Watching it, all I could think of was the challenges you had. Two questions. First of all, what made you want to do this? And secondly, what was the biggest challenge you faced in making a documentary about the Bee Gees? Frank, let's start with you. Well, great to be there with you or here with you, Stephen. And um, um, for me, um, you know, I grew up in a musical family right there in Newport Beach uh, over on Lido Isle. So um, I've been around music all my life. Um, and I've also loved the Bee Gees music all my life. So um, it was kind of a natural journey to, for me to, to take when I heard, when I first met with Stephen, Steve Barnett at Capitol Records, and uh, we were talking about um, groups and, and people that might be interesting to um, sort of rekindle their catalog. And he had just bought the Bee Gees. And I thought, well, there's, a, there's an interesting idea. And because I grew up in a family of, of musicians and guitar players and composers, um, I found sort of a connection to what the Gibbs must have gone through as a family. So I, I really approached it as a family story about music. And then I discovered along the way, this incredible treasure trove of creativity that they had, their, their love of music, but also their humor and their, you know, the, the, the sort of gathering of the family and, the, and, and how the family moved together, the brothers, uh, I have brothers and, and their loyalty and, and how, how all this sort of came together, even when there were challenges and hurdles in their lives as they grew up, how the family unit stayed together the entire time. So that's kind of what got me interested. And what was the biggest challenge of making it? I'll let Nigel answer that one. Um, there uh, were a lot. <laughs> thank you, Stephen. And, and actually, I, I didn't grow up in a musical family, but much like Frank, I knew about the Bee Gees. So many people will, will discover in this film for the first time. I think the biggest challenge is making any film about a living artist and family is to find the right way to tell the story and, and to keep your artistic independence, which we were allowed to have, and Frank as a director was allowed to have, and at the same time, honor, honor the story. Um, the, I think that the, this, particular, this particular journey was, was made more difficult by the fact that Robin and Morris are not with us. We had to find a way to give them a voice in the film. Barry was completely adamant when we first met him, that although he's incredibly well spoken and thoughtful person that he wanted to be all three of them and, and not to forget Andy, which is a sad part of the story. Um, so we, we found a way, as you know, by using some particularly great interviews that were done in 1999 to, to give them a voice in the film. But that, that, was, that was tricky. Um, and ultimately the way we solved that problem was to hit head on at the beginning that Barry was the last man standing and he says, in the interview, I know that these memories are my memories and they would have different memories. And at a stroke, we eliminated the, well, this is Barry's version of the story. Well, let's talk about that meeting with him and what he wanted, because, you know, we've all dealt with major named celebrities and they have an image to preserve. Uh, presume you didn't have to get him to sign off on the rights because the, the, the documentary is soaked with their music. Um, did you have that to begin with or did you have to get his permission? No, it was really um, because Capital had just bought their catalog and, and Barry had come into town the first time I met him. He'd come into town to do this special uh, during the Grammys that was about the Bee Gees music. And so, um, you know, he was incredibly gracious and humble. And, and you know, uh, as I started talking to him, I realized how much bigger everything was than Saturday Night Fever. Yeah. And, and so it really became a celebration of their legacy. And, um, and we all came together and, you know, we got on this journey. It's been a three year journey. It's wow. been quite amazing, but um, Nigel can talk about the, you know, the nuts and bolts of, of clearances and stuff, but we had them from the start. Yeah. I, these big projects, you start off with, 
if the artist doesn't want to do it, it's not going to happen. Um, and, um, as, 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 and, and all the rights were, were with UMG and Capital, so we were able to get those. And it was really about finding, finding, we did a lot, Frank did a lot of interviews with Barry and finding a, a, a modality where Barry could go back and revisit his history, but we also wanted to tell the history in a contemporary way as it happened then, and then have Barry looking back on it and to find that balance in the storytelling. Um, which eventually we found that was a big challenge to make that feel a smooth transition for the viewer. So, tell you, me you, about your first meeting with him, where it took place, how, what, how the conversation went. Frank? Well, the, my first meeting was in the Capitol Tower, um, where coincidentally my dad had um, been, you know, 50, 60 years ago. Oh. Um, and so for me, it was an incredibly nostalgic and, and wonderful moment to be back in the tower where I, as a kid, I had grown up in Studio A and watching all these great musicians uh, play. And, and so it reminded me of my dad. Um, so it really felt like it was exactly the right thing to do to be meeting Barry there for the first time. Just the two of you or other people present? And what was the conversation? Well, it was Steve Barnett, who's run, you know, runs Capitol Records. It was in his office and uh, uh, Barry came in and I believe Dick Ashby was there, who's his lifelong uh, friend and, and manager. And uh, yeah, we just talked about our families. It was really, really special and easy and warm. And I think we trusted each other. Um, and of course, you know, he's been involved from the start right up here to the end. And, and, and the challenge was, to be honest, was um, the hardest part of all of this. But as he says, you know, we all have our memories and that launched us into, into this journey, which is, you know, full of things I didn't know. And then would, they would take another turn this way and that way. But that's what I love about documentaries. He didn't ask for any approvals or anything. I, I'll take that one, Frank. I want to actually add to Frank's previous answer, um, but but just on that question, all of these artists, they do have approval and they don't have approval. You want the artist to support the film, but if they're a real artist, Frank is a real artist and in, in a producer kind of way I am. And and Barry, you know, Barry's smart enough to know that he wants our best work. I mean, he's seen the things that Frank has produced and some things I've worked on. And, 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 and so... That 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 has never been a problem in any of the big docs hmm. worked on or Frank's worked on. Um, I think you you always have a moment with people. Frank told me some story involving the Sinatra family, and I have a similar story involving the Pavarotti family. You know, there seems to be a moment when there's a lot of but but ultimately what they're doing is they're not actually criticizing your film. They're coming to terms with the life they've lived. And that's what actually is happening. So they see things and they're upset about it. They're not upset about the way you've dealt with it because we, 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 we always have a rule, and Frank and I separately, but together, which is we're focused on things that will matter in a hundred years' time about this artist when we're all gone. What will matter? And, you know, and um, but going back to meeting, Frank took me down to meet Barry, and we had actually the executives there. And, and Barry is now Miami. getting sorry yeah, in, Miami. in Miami, in, in Miami, full on in his house with you know a lot of memories all around him and and. And, and Frank had met him by then a few times, and I'd grown up knowing who Barry Gibb was in the 60s, never years gone by. And here we are talking to this man, and you're thinking all this music. And so he says, well, what do you guys want to do with this film? So Frank says, it's about creativity, which is, you know, a great, great answer. It's a story of creativity, not a story of a pop band. So he then points at me and says, you, you, what, what, how are you going to do that? So Frank looks at me and just says, you know, <laughs> So it came out of my mouth, um, which, which I, we, we want to reintroduce you to your audience. And he says, what do you mean by that? I said, well, as Frank said, you know, you're a band of creativity. You've written all these songs. You've produced all these songs. You've changed over the ages. People know your music, but nobody really knows your journey. And he said, if you two do that, I'll give you everything, which is what we, I think we like to think we did. Um, so, so that was, uh, that was, that was very nerve wracking, but, but fun. And, and I think Barry, in a funny sort of way, he, he gets people. He knew he was kind of challenging us a little bit. And, and, and I'm, I'm the producer, so he can give me a little bit of help, you know, whereas you've got to respect the director. Yes. <laughs> so, 
but we actually i think we felt actually the reason i'm telling that story is i think both frank frank and i and and mark monroe and Jeannie faster are producing partners and mark's a wonderful writer as well as as producer with us um we felt that that was the call to action and we hope in the film that we introduced as frank said at the beginning three brothers who had this astonishing creative collective which became a pop band and then a rock band but ultimately it was about their creativity because they could do anything um i mean frank if you want to talk a little bit about barbara and that other work um yeah we're, it was really about their adapting to the different um eras that they lived through and you know how many about is, is later on when they they started working with barbara streisand and, and writing songs which i didn't know at all um you mentioned with Edward just that one moment, what was the moment with Barry Gibb and what was the moment with the Sinatra family? Um, well, the, the moment with Barry, you know, when you get into these stories and you, you start digging, you know, there are things that are sensitive and, and you have to respect those. And, you know, for us, it was really telling the story. Oh, the of actual how, big thing that he was sensitive about. Yeah. Well, he's sensitive about his family. You know, he, he, he loves his family. He incredibly misses his brothers. Um, and, you know, we all have family problems and we all have, you know, family solutions. And what I- Was I, it his relationship with Robin? Was it the death of Andy? What, what was the one that really bothered him? Well, I think it, it's really that he's having to tell the story by himself. And um, so he didn't want to give any kind of spin um, that wasn't his own. So he was, he, he was very careful um, and very respectful of the other families and his brothers and their families. And so we, we had to really pay attention to that. that. That was really the most sensitive issue which is also the most important thing to me is I wanted to learn or try to discover how this all happened. How, how did they come together? How did they learn how to sing in harmony? How did they write songs together? Where did that come from? And as you see in the movie, it just, you know, it somehow comes <laughs> out of the air. Very well. uh, what, you mentioned the Sinatra family. What were they, cur what were they? Uh, is it, again, the same thing. Everybody's very sensitive to the family issues and, and how they're perceived and, and that it's not, um, it's not a tabloid look at things. It's who are the real people? I mean, we all have, you know, disagreements in our families. What are, you know, what meant the most to you and what was the truth? And that was really the issue for both of them. What surprised you both about the most that you discovered in, in researching this documentary? Well, I, <clears throat> I could start. I mean, the surprise for me was the drum loop for Saturday Night Fever. I had no idea. And it was- you explain a, that for the, for the audience, uh, what exactly happened. It is an amazing moment in the documentary. Well, the, the whole coming together of the Saturday Night Fever soundtrack was an incredible story, which I had no idea about. You know, I just assumed they had been asked to write the music for the movie, just like we do in all our movies. But it was co a complete, um, you know, sort of last minute Hail Mary pass by Robert Stigwood, um, who was producing this movie and he called them up because they were the main band and said, Hey, you got any songs? I've got this movie in. <laughs> and, and, you know, I need some music for it. And they were in France and they were um, developing some songs for a new album, not for a movie. They didn't even read the script. And they had these five incredible songs that they started to lay down. But as they started to lay down one of them, uh, the drummer um, was called away to England because um, one of his parents uh, was ill. And so they kept going. And the way they kept going was that uh, the two engineers, uh, Albie and, um, and uh, Carl Richardson, Albie Gluten and Carl Richardson, invented this way, invented the first drum loop 
out of tracks that they ha had already done. And when the drummer came back, he, he, he couldn't dispute the fact that it was fantastic and perfect. And that's how that beat that now, I guess, you know, paramedics use to give CPR. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That beat, so you see the tape stretched yeah. out and literally going around this, this loop. Uh, Nigel, what was the most surprising moment for you? In, in um, I think there was one specific story that I'll be told uh, at an audio engineer's symposium in New York, which would normally sound incredibly boring, but they were talking about making Saturday Night Fever and Frank and I went to it. And Albie told this story about Barry's musical gifts. You know, when you say somebody's a genius, you might say, you know, Elton John's a genius, Barry. What does that exactly mean? And he said, well, it means many things. But one of his skills was he had completely perfect pitch. They were recording the song Too Much Heaven, which is one of their biggest hits, which they gave to UNICEF. And, they're, and they'll have three-part harmonies on all their music, really, uh, the Bee Gees. And often Barry would record some of the harmonies. And Albie said, so he decides... The others are not there. He's going to record all the harmonies and he decides there'll be two octaves so without making it too boring. There's two octaves and three harmonies. You end up with 18 parts. So he said, so we start off, we've done the basic track. Now we do one part. And I say, would you like to hear the guide track? Meaning what, what you're singing against? No, no, no. So we go on seven or eight. And he says, now, remember, I've, he said, I've mixed Michael Jackson. He would go back and, and he's perfect and he would listen to the guide track. So we get to all 18 tracks Barry's done and they're all in different ranges all over the place on Too Much Heaven. And Barry says, OK, bring it up, which means he slides up all 18 sliders. And he says, I was thinking, this is going to be interesting. And he said it was completely perfect. He said the hair went up the back of my neck. This, he has this brain, which in addition to being a very nice man socially and a brilliant songwriter and a great musician, he has a depth of just knowledge that's in there. And I remember thinking, um, telling that story to Glenn Johns, the famous music producer, and, and he, he said, I mean, he, Glenn Johns is a very hard person to impress, as, as Frank knows. Um, he said that the, one of the Stones producers, amongst other things, and he said, that's extraordinary. So that really, that really is a story I told. We couldn't figure out how to put it in the film because it's really, as a, it's really complicated, as you can see from me telling it. Yes. But it, is, it speaks to the fact that in addition to all the social skills Barry has and all the creative skills and the brother management skills, he's also got this thing going on in here. And I thought that was fascinating. Yes. Two questions before we wrap up. One is, um, Frank, you, you've been making some documentaries. Obviously, to anybody in Hollywood, you're known as the producer of some of the biggest Hollywood films around the, the Bourne franchise, a lot of Spielberg's work. You've had some complicated experiences in the documentary field. Most notably, you made a documentary about Lance Armstrong, uh, which presented him in a very positive light. And then I believe after the documentary was made, it emerged that he had been taking um, drugs. How did you react to that? And how did it change your approach to documentary making? That's what I love about documentaries. You never know what, when a left term is going to present itself that's going to take you down a completely different path. Luckily, we, we had finished that doc, and, but it hadn't been released. And so uh, Alex Gibney directed that one. And I went to Alex and I said, you know, obviously, this has got to be on the shelf. What, what if we went back and we had Lance, you know, tell us the real story now? And um, we we're the, able to pull that off and it became, you know, it went from, uh, Alex liked to say it went from breaking away to breaking bad. <laughs> yes, that's a good line. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, those kind of situations. Did it change I, I, your feeling about people or, or your belief in your own intuition? No, look, I, I, I'm... I'm an optimistic, positive thinker, and I always like to see the good in people, and I thought it was the greatest, you know, athletic story I'd, I'd ever seen. And I, and I was there with him for all those days for a whole year and watched him ride and, and go to hospitals, and I, I did see the positive effect he had on people. So, you know, hey, look, we all have our, our um, you know, uh, we're all fallible, we, we all, you know, have um, good and bad things that happen to us. And uh, 
we all make mistakes, you know, um, he's a human being. So, um, you know, I, I, I love to examine how people get to where they are. And that's what I loved about Barry, talking to Barry and, and trying to draw out, you know, you never think about things when you're doing them. You know, I never think about when I'm a directing a movie, I, it just comes out. And when he's writing a song, it just comes out. But the amazing thing for me was that he was, he was not, he was not arrogant. He wasn't, um, you know, he wasn't the, the dictator of everything. He was incredibly collaborative, which is why it worked with his brothers. He was the gatherer of all of these things. And you see in the movie, you see him say to the keyboard player, yeah, that, yeah, do that. That's great. That works in great. And so he involved everyone in whatever he was creating. And that's what I loved about it. Last question for both of you. You have a time capsule and there's only room for one Bee Gees song. Which one is it? Uh, for me, it's too much heaven. Mm. Why? Well, I think it just in, encompasses everything they've done um, because, you know, it was a rocket to stardom <clears throat> and then they fell off two or three times off the, you know, the top of the hill. And uh, sometimes you have too much heaven. And, and, you know, for them, it was a very special song that they wrote and they gave um, to, uh, uh, to a charity as a philanthropic gesture. So I think it means a lot to them as well. To me, it describes, it actually was, at one time we were, that was the title of the movie. So for me, it encompasses everything for them. Why did you not title it that? I'll let, go ahead, Nigel. Well, we, 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 it was too much. It was my, my, the Bee Gees, you know, the Miami has too much heaven. It became, the film became bigger than that. It became more about people, not about a place. And the, the place that was too much heaven in our little word game was, was Miami. Um, can I pick my song? Sure. Um, my, my song would be For Whom the Bell Tolls, which is a song in the early 90s that the Bee Gees recorded, which is a memory of Andy Gibb. Um, and the reason that I would pick it is that it's absolutely epic song of enormous scale and reach vocally. And it's the three brothers coming back again. They've made up and broken up and made up and been kicked out of the business and come back and all got their own families and all other bands at that point would never have made it. And they're back in the studio. They don't have a producer. They're producing it themselves and they make this extraordinary song for whom the bell tolls. And it's, it's heartbreaking. And of course it's based on a great novel title. Um, so I would say that speaks to my feelings about the Bee Gees, that they just kept going for five decades and it didn't keep going coasting. They kept renewing their, 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 their characteristic work. Frank Marshall is the director and one of the producers. Nigel Sinclair is also producer of the Bee Gees. How can you mend a broken heart? It's a terrific documentary. Thank you both so much for giving me this time. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Stephen. Yeah, great to talk to you, Stephen. Hope to see you soon. Bye -bye. See you in next semester, Frank. Okay. Bye. Thanks, Nigel. Okay. Bye. And bye to all my friends in Newport.